In this lecture, we're going to continue studying graph theory, and in particular, we're going to get into uh, more detail um, concerning spanning trees and spanning fours, and discuss applications and and how to um, how to solve the problem of finding spanning trees and spanning fours. So spanning trees and also forests um, come up in a lot of practical situations. Um, trees more than forests, to be honest. Um, usually one is beginning with a connected graph, and so if it's a connected graph you start with, then you're interested in looking for a spanning tree. Um, very often here I won't even mention spanning forests. I'll just say spanning tree and... and um, the extension to force will be sort of obvious. All right, so, so problems arise where you're looking for a spanning tree, like say uh, you might have a graph that represents a, a lot of computers, and the edges might represent um, um, potential pairs of computers that can be connected together, okay? And, and then the spanning tree might represent um, the the um, the computers that you actually choose to connect with wire. All right, so you run a wire between two computers if and only if that edge is in the spanning tree. Okay, well that gives you a minimal way to hook up um, computers so they'll be connected, and um, that that's maybe you know, just an off-the-cuff kind of application for spanning trees. But the fact is, the spanning trees come up in lots of ways that aren't expected. Um, I can recall studying electronics and um, being really amazed at the fact that resistor circuits um, can be discussed in terms of spanning trees. Um, if we start with a graph that has edge weights, uh, which is very natural in a lot of circumstances, then it's very possible that what we want to do is not, not, not to settle for any old spanning tree, um, because I remind you that a connected graph generally has lots of different spanning trees. Um, we might be um, you know, much happier if we can find the spanning tree with the property that the sum of the weights of the edges in that tree is as small as possible. Okay, that's a very standard um, um, problem, and, and we're going to address it in this lecture, and we're going to, in fact, look at two different ways to solve this problem. Okay, that is, given a graph with edge weights, find a minimal spanning tree. In other words, find a spanning tree whose sum of edge weights is as small as possible. Okay, um, yeah, it's a very straightforward thing that every connected graph has at least one spanning tree and generally has, has several. Okay, um, usually there are more than one spanning tree. And, yeah, if the graph is not connected, well, then at least it'll have a spanning force. But I say again, I don't want to talk too much about force here. Um, our focus will really be on connected graphs and then looking for spanning trees in them. So if we begin with a graph that has edge weights, um, like I said, we, we can talk about um, for a particular spanning forest or spanning tree, uh, we can talk about the sum of the weights um, of all the edges in that forest. Okay, we'll call that the total weight of the forest or the total weight of the tree. And as I say, an important problem is um, to find a minimal spanning forest, that is a forest whose sum of weights is as small as possible. Okay, I say again, in practical circumstances, the, the graph we start with is probably connected, so we probably end up with a minimal spanning tree. Okay, let's look at an example um, concerning connecting cables. 
um, something like I was talking about a moment ago. But let's say this time, instead of computers being connected by a network, what we're trying to do is lay some kind of communication cables between cities. It, it, could, be, um, it could be any kind of um, maybe transmission cables of some sort. Um, but anyway, the vertices in this graph represent cities, right? And we begin with a graph that shows, um, you know, the potential um, for running cables between cities. And we assign weights to the edges there to reflect how much it would cost to lay such a cable. Okay? So the edge weights, in this case, they don't really represent distances. Uh, they represent costs. Okay, but nevertheless, um, it still makes sense to add up all these edge weights and, um, and, and then think about total costs. Okay, so let's look at the example. Uh, actually, we'll look at the example in just a second. So just to sort of repeat real fast that um, we're thinking about a connected graph because we're thinking that it's possible to to hook up all the cities together in a connected way, um, we'll be <clears throat> searching for a minimal spanning tree because we want to find the cheapest way to lay cables. Um, use just just as just as much cable as we need and, and as cheaply as possible, so as to connect all the cities together. Okay, and don't worry if we're not going to worry about the case where the cities can't be connected. Um, that would be a spanning force case, but let's not worry about that. Okay, so this is the graph I have in mind. And as you see, the, the, it reflects the potential to connect various cities together and the underlying cost. Um, so, for example, it's possible to run cable from Paris to Moscow, and that would incur a cost of 14. Um, don't ask me what units of, of money we're using here. I'm not really interested in that. Um, but whatever units, 14 to go from Paris to Moscow, whereas it's like 11 to connect London and Moscow, and so forth. Okay. So let me just quickly um, slap an answer up here. This right here turns out to be the unique minimum spanning tree. Now, I want to point out that, you know, not only is this a spanning tree, but it's the only one that comes in with the least cost, right? Um, that might make you wonder, well, is the minimum spanning tree always unique? And the answer to that is is definitely no. It's not always unique. But if you check out the details in this example, um, I, I challenge you to convince yourself that for this example, we really have found here uh, the unique minimal spanning tree. And I'm not going to uh, spend time over talking this. Um, just take a look and maybe do some arithmetic. So the total weight of this particular spanning tree is, what, 32 plus 5 plus 11 plus 15, dot, dot, dot. Okay, we uh, basically just pulled that minimum spanning tree out of thin air for that previous example. Um, in real-world situations, of course, that's not always so easy to do. Sometimes you have a graph with lots of vertices and um, yeah so we're going to be um, more interested in having a computational approach to solving this minimum spanning tree problem okay and in fact there are two famous algorithms for um, for finding minimum spanning trees in weighted connected groups. and um, we're going to look at both of them all right um, seems to me that every discrete math course um, <clears throat> teaches at least one of these, and um, I think it's interesting to compare them, so we'll look at both. Okay, I say again that 
you know, we could work inside a non-connected graph and then end up with minimum spanning force, but uh, I want to connected graphs and trees. Okay, the names of the algorithms are Kruskal's algorithm and Prim's algorithm. Both of these algorithms work by building the spanning tree up a little bit at a time. Um, choosing edges in, in a um, basically trying to choose low low weighted edges to build up the solution uh, but there's some subtleties and 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 each each of the two algorithms approaches these subtleties a little differently okay as the obvious thing is as we're selecting edges to include into the spanning tree, um, it's essential that we, we do not select an edge that would introduce a cycle, right? Because if we, if we wind up putting a cycle into it, then it's no longer a tree. It's no longer acyclic. Okay, and as I say, Kruskal and Prim handle this issue somewhat differently. Let's begin by looking at Kruskal's algorithm. Kruskal's algorithm is a very good example of what's known as a greedy algorithm. And there's a rather technical definition for what that means, and, and we're not going to get into all that here. But, you know, suffice it to say that at each step along the way, we, we do what seems to be optimal at the moment, okay? And it's a very nice thing that, that that turns out to be, in the long run, the correct thing to do, okay? Life is not always like that. It happens that this spanning tree problem, you know, is like that. You can solve it by doing what's optimal at the moment, okay? So... It does pretty much what I said. It, it selects... Uh, edges, and each time it has to select an edge, it tries to select one whose weight is as small as possible among all of the unselected edges. But, as I've also said, it, we have to be careful because if that edge would introduce a cycle, then we cannot select that edge. We have to throw that edge away, right? reject that edge and then go look for another least weight edge okay um and actually this business of of trying to to know somehow knowing whether or not the introduction of a particular edge would create a cycle that's actually a a technically tricky issue This business of deciding whether or not adding a particular edge would introduce a cycle is not, um, well, not completely trivial, but it turns out that there are very nice, efficient methods for dealing with it. Okay, these methods dealing with this issue, pretty, pretty usually these are ignored in, like I said, discrete math courses that introduce Kruskal's algorithm. Um, however, we're going to deal with with all of the details, and um, in fact, I have provided for this course uh, Java and C++ code that implement Kruskal and also Prim's algorithm um, in detail, and um, in particular for Kruskal's algorithm, it deals with this issue of how do we decide if adding an edge will cause a cycle. Okay, and it, it pretty much works like this. Um, at each stage along the way, we'll have selected certain edges. And what we want to think about is a particular subgraph, namely the subgraph of the original graph that all of the vertices and only the selected edges. Okay? So... That's a perfectly legitimate subgraph. It includes all of the vertices, so therefore it's a spanning subgraph by definition. Okay? 
but it only includes some of the edges. In the beginning, it doesn't include any edges. And then as we start selecting edges and adding them, um, we get more and more edges. Okay? You see how this goes. Um, all the way through the procedure, we're dealing with spanning subgraph, but in the beginning, it's very disconnected. Right? We have a lot of vertices and no edges, so it's highly disconnected. Then as we start adding edges, the subgraph becomes more and more connected. Okay, so what we need to do here, or at least this is how we're going to address this, this whole issue. Um, what we're going to do is keep track of the connected components of the subgraph. So I say again, in the beginning, the subgraph consists of all the vertices and none of the edges. Therefore, each vertex will be its own connected component. Okay? There will be lots of connected components. And then as we start adding edges, um, things will become connected, and the number of connected components will go down and down and down until eventually, um, again, assuming we started with a connected graph, um, eventually the subgraph will also become connected.